use uh, this expression or to discuss with you a little bit more. No, please. Yeah. Uh, to discuss with you a little bit more, first of all, show your, uh, your few graphic representation, also show you the connection between uh, this and flux quantization. Now, I told you before that in the beginning, and for simplicity, I assume, let me draw my ring here once more, that I assume for simplicity that this flux phi here shall be altogether due to an external source. And I assume, in fact, rigorously, that there is no field here. And actually, the proof is perfectly rigorous. That is to say, if you add in the Hamiltonian to the field produced by external sources, the internal field, the proof goes right through because it concerns only the external potential. That was the field. <coughs> Nevertheless, I would like now to include, to go on and discuss with you the effect of the field produced by the ring itself. Now, one has to be a little bit careful here. What I would like to do is, I would like to tell you Take this formula unaltered, but interpret phi now to mean not the external flux, but the total flux. Now, rigorously speaking, I'm not entitled to ask you to do that unless I assume that the flux or the field produced by the current itself likewise vanishes in the material. Now, this is not exactly true. It is largely true. In a real superconductor, there's something called the Meissner effect, which expels the field, including its own field, except for a very thin layer, the so-called penetration depth, at the edge of the superconductor. So there's a little flaw there. Uh, things become a little bit more important, I wouldn't say a great deal more serious, when you have a barrier, because if the barrier itself... Oh, excuse me, I would like to say one more thing before I before I said I forgot to say that. I discussed with you that if, as I introduce a barrier, eventually this uh, uh, only one term remains. And in any event, as the barrier increases more and more, this current here becomes smaller and smaller. Because in the limit of an infinite barrier is zero. Now, <clears throat> actually, you can achieve that in other ways. You can make the current, of course, zero. You make it by taking a hacksaw. No, that's not quite true. You can also do something else. You can interlace a normal metal in here. You have a normal metal in the superconductor. That does not, of course, prevent an ohmic current to flow, but it does prevent a supercurrent to flow. That is to say, as far as this expression is concerned, which says you can even have a current with a constant flux or zero voltage, that becomes the less true, the thicker the metal layer is. So therefore, for this purposes, a metal is as good a barrier for the supercurrent. A metal is as good a barrier as a uh, oxide gap. Besides, it's an awful lot easier to make <laughs> than the other. A third, which is easiest, although Dr. Devo may contradict with me, is uh, what one calls a weak link. You can also make the current gradually disappear by taking a file and filing off your superconductor, make it thinner and thinner and thinner until you have eventually broken it. And if it is sufficiently thin, well, I think it's plausible. There's also continuous study. That's another way of doing it. Or you can take a screw and tighten it in the superconductor or have all kinds of tricks. So I just wanted to say that there are all these kinds of barriers which are well known and used in experimental physics metallic barriers, oxide barriers, weak link barriers, they all fall under that category. The important thing for us is only there is some way of gradually decreasing the current. Not suddenly, but gradually. All right, now then. Okay, that's what I want to say. Now then, let's go back to this. Uh, I said just before um, that uh, in a, I cannot, I have to make a slight uh, correction for the penetration of the of the magnetic field if I take the, its own field into account. Now, when it comes to the barrier, and I have this, uh, and the barrier, the, now I'm talking about a real barrier, not, not weak link, but a barrier, either a metal or a, 
oxide layer, there can, of course, be field penetration in the barrier. And these are very interesting uh, problems to ask yourself, how does the field uh, vary in that barrier? And they have been discussed by Josephson, and I also mentioned them in a paper. I just don't want to go into these complications. So let us assume, then, that we can, in fact, neglect the flux, even the flux produced by the current itself. This is not a very serious assumption. First of all, as I say, there is only this very thin penetration layer where the field is different from zero. And if you make the thin ring, uh, ring thin enough and you don't have to make it very thin, this penetration into the barrier becomes also a negligible effect. So I will assume that. And in that case, then, my proof goes just the same way, except that phi is now the total flux. Now let me break it up then, and write it simply in the form phi naught and phi one. And phi naught is internal flux, let me call it that way. By internal, I don't mean internal in the ring, but I mean produced by the electrons themselves in this region here. There's a phi naught and the phi one. It's the flux produced by the current itself, and phi one is what we before called phi. External flux. And under the assumption which I made before, I maintain this equation here. However, there is now a second equation which I have to consider for phi naught. Uh, if you have a current going through here, and because of Ampere's law, it will make a field proportional to the current, and the flux will be proportional to the current. And in fact, the relationship between flux and current, here's now my current, is very simple. It is simply L I, uh, let me think, L I C, is it? Well, it's very simple. 1 over C d phi by dt. That's the electron, it's L times I dot, that's the definition, that's the self-conductance. I think that's right, isn't it? Okay, all right. So, I have this equation. Oh, yeah, let me in fact now write this as phi minus phi one. This is the important equation. What I want to do is the following thing. I consider phi, phi is the total flux, and phi 1 is my external flux, which I can vary by varying my resistor, which feeds my solenoid. Phi 1 is the variable. And now, you see, I have now two equations. Phi 1 is given, it's the external flux which you put in. And now I have two equations, this one and that one here, between i and phi, which in principle allows me to solve for both. That is to say, for a given external flux, you can find out what the current is, and then you can also find out what the total flux is, because you simply add to the original flux the flux produced by the current. But instead of doing that, I want to discuss it with you graphically. And so I'm going to plot now a periodic function. I'm plotting phi, i against phi. In a schematic form, it is zero, of course, for phi equal to zero, and then it varies somehow with a negative slope, presumably, and goes something like this. Well, that's just very schematic. And <coughs> here phi is zero, and here is hc over, well, now it's hc over 2e, right? Because now n is equal to 2. Oh, by the way, let me, let me introduce this. You see, if, if n is even, then you can write i as minus i n uh, sine 2 pi uh, n uh, phi over phi star, the so-called flux quantum. It repeats itself periodically whenever the flux increases by this value. All I have done is simply consider that n is even. Now I go over all integers of some. Now I, I go over all integers instead of taking it e instead of summating only over the, over the even integers, uh, summate over all, but replace n by 2, 2n, two or e by 2e. And so that's another way of saying it. So with other words, this repeats itself periodically. Here's one flux quantum, and here are two flux quanta, and here's minus a flux quantum, and so forth. 
That represents this equation. Let me call that equation number one. That is the graphic representation of equation one. Now, equation two is even simpler. That's a straight line. Now, let me first assume, let's first take the case where phi one is zero. No external flux. I just leave the ring to itself. Well, then my equation one, uh, two is simply a straight line going through the origin. And now you see that I get a whole series of possible values where one and two intercept these are the common solutions of these two equations. So one is trivial, no current, no flux, but this one is already not quite so trivial, and so forth. And over here too. You notice that I made circles and I made crosses. The reason is this. I will again not prove that. You can also derive these two equations simultaneously by demanding the free energy to be a minimum. That is, of course, one of the equilibrium conditions of thermodynamics. And, <coughs> however, it is not quite true. These two equations demand only that the free energy has an extremum. You get it by saying df by d, di is zero. And therefore, it can be both stable and unstable. And you have to go to the second derivative. And let me assure you that in order to have a stable minimum, uh, it is necessary that the slope of the curve 1 is greater in the algebraic sense than, than 2. You see here, 2 has a negative slope, and i has a positive slope. At this point, it's the other way around. This has a bigger slope, so that won't do. So with other words, the classes are unstable equilibrium. But these are stable. And now, assume this curve to have very large swings, really, I, much more than I said here. Well, then you see, of course, that the uh, permissible values come practically with very great accuracy at integer multiples of phi or phi star, and that is, of course, what uh, was experimentally found. So that is the special case of flux quantization, just as we expected. In order to get flux quantization, you need large currents. You don't want the barrier, by no means. You want the large swing of the current. And then you find that these are so. I mean, this is, in a way, uh, just phrased differently the argument of Bias and Yang explaining flux quantization. Now, now we'll introduce a barrier. And I will right away go to, go to already a fairly high barrier where I can approximate this generally. Well, by the way, this need not be a sine function at all. In fact, it can be a function. It can look like that. But as you come down to a sufficiently small barrier, I showed you, it becomes eventually so. This is not, no barrier, let's say. No barrier. And therefore, flux quantization. Now I go to a barrier, and then it becomes a, just a sine function. And of course, with an amplitude, the smaller, the higher you make the barrier. Again, I, phi, zero, phi star, two phi star, and so forth. And now, let me again, this is, this is now my curve two for barrier. In fact, severe barrier, but not infinite barrier, otherwise I would get zero. And now let me again draw my curve one. First, for phi one, this is my curve one. No, I'm sorry. This was one. And this is two. That is one, and, uh, and uh, up there is equation two, a straight line. Oh, again, for phi one equal to zero. All right, well, that's not very exciting. No current, no flux. Now, if phi one is different from zero, you see, here, take this equation here, then I, this, Simply replaced, the slope is the same, but it's replaced by a straight line. By a straight line. <laughs> well, all right. And you see, it intercepts zero. The current becomes zero when this displacement is phi one. You displace it. Now, I wish I had a movie camera. I want you to assume that I now, I, I want to show you now the Josephson effect. That means I should increase my external flux uniformly in time. That is, take this curve and slide it over parallel to itself. You see, L, L and C are remain the same. But this is a slope 
a curve of slope 1 over LC, but shifted it, shifting its intercept with 0. And so now you move along steadily. As you see, the intercept moves along this curve up and down and up and down. Please notice that since I, the slope of this curve has a very small amplitude in the way I have drawn it, it is all, everything is always stable. That is to say, the slope of this line is bigger than the slope that curve 2 can ever take. So you go through a series of stable equilibria, and you move along here, nicely stable equilibrium, and you see the current going up and down, sinusoidally. And if you look at it, it's just my old argument. Uh, every time you come to phi star, the current has returned to zero. So it's just exactly the chosen frequency exhibited this way. And in order to get this nice variation, you have to be sure that, well, I mean, that, that's the purpose of the barrier, is so to say, to assure that you can have stable equilibrium all the time. Now, let me now take an intermediate case. Uh, let me say that uh, that's one for a uh, wide barrier. A wide barrier, well, that has already shrunk quite small. You don't get much of a Josephson curve, but you still get a finite one. All right, now there are intermediate cases which are also very interesting. Let me again draw this curve. I will again assume a sine curve, but bit with bigger amplitude than I did before. So that's now my number two for medium barrier. Well, still it's not much of a barrier, still rather small. And here is again my, my curve. No, that's one. My curve two. All right, nothing much happens here. Now let's play the same game. Again, we displace this curve here gradually, increasing the external flux. So we go down this curve. Everything is fine, still stable. This slope bigger than that until you come to this point here. And now you see all of a sudden the thing stops. This is what you may call an indifferent equilibrium. Huh? Now, oh, by the way, of course, in between here, for example, you would have uh, this situation here stable, but here unstable, right? And as you move that thing to the stable and the unstable, you will always remain in the stable. The stable and the unstable come together. It's indefinite equilibrium. And then, goodbye, nothing anymore. What's the poor thing going to do? Well, you have to draw this line through. And you see, all of a sudden, there appears a new stable equilibrium. And what happens from this point to here? Of course, this is an irreversible transition. At this point, what happens is, that the current suddenly makes a jump, and phi makes a jump. This is phi, this is i, and this displacement is always phi 1. So when, when here, this is the value of phi 1 at which this happens. This is the critical curve here. Phi 1 is this this way. When phi 1 is this big, at this fixed value, the flux can suddenly go from this value, which is phi, to this value. It makes a jump. Then you go on, oh fine, all right, it says follows again until you come here. And then makes another jump. Now suppose you go back. Oh, you have increased flux, now go back one. Well, it's stable. Now it is again stable, unstable. You come again to uh, unstable equilibrium here. Jump. You notice what happens. You don't follow the same curve backward as you follow forward. Forward you go this way. I can start here, sorry. Ah. Backward, you can go on a little bit. Backward, you go this way. And then, of course, by the way, you can continue here. Oh, oh and then you come back, go this way, so. Yeah? With other words, you have the phenomenon of hysteresis. And the important thing is here that every time, that is, if you look at the point for phi 1 at which these jumps happen. Here is one. The next one occurs, of course, exactly one flux quantum displaced. So as you change your flux, you get a series of discontinuities. If you plot, plot, plot the applied flux phi 1 against the total flux, what you find is so, and then a jump, and so, and so, and you go back, and you get uh, 
Wait a minute, yeah, right. Get this and that and so on. We have a series of loops. By the way, I would like to say if you make this amp too bigger, you can also have jumped sometimes by two quanta, three quanta, and so forth. But it is certainly true that every time the, the, the point dis discontinuous are displaced by phi star, and this, since this is a conference on superconducting devices, I will conclude with a modest remark that this is a magnetometer. I don't know. Sure, sure. If this not too bad. You know, as I heard Professor Bloch talk today, I thought I knew a little about the Josephson Junction, but I realized there is more in heaven and earth about this than I've understood in the past. So it's a really illuminating lecture. Are there any questions that the audience? We can repeat Dr. them here, Ed. Okay. Uh, I thought, Dr. Matthew, did you have a question? All right. Well, this is a, a more general question. There have been a number of the leading workers in the field. Uh, for example, Professor Bardeen, uh, Professor Anderson, and Professor Freilich that have commented in recent years that, uh, that they sort of think that things are pretty much solved in superconductivity. There's really nothing of, uh, of great interest left for the theoretician to do. Uh, as a theoretician myself, I'd like to uh, think otherwise, but would you care, Professor Block, to comment on, uh, on what you feel about this? Do you think there are any uh, unsolved fundamental problems remaining in superconductivity? There are certainly unsolved problems, whether, but whether they can be solved and, and who will solve them, I do not know. Uh, I know, I mean, I, have a, I can show you sometime a letter which I received from Phil Anderson in which he said that he considers the foundation of the BS, BCS theory to be as firm as that of special relativity. Now, uh, this is a, <laughs> I'm sorry, I cannot agree with him to that. And uh, if, I, if you want to quote authorities, I think I have also my allies. Yang feels the same way I do. We have the greatest respect and admiration for the BCS theory, but we cannot close our eyes to the fact that it is an approximate theory. Well, I mean, you can, of course, do it this way. You can say, all right, there is a total Hamiltonian, but some terms are not important. And you cross these out, then you get the pen, get the BCS theory. Another way of doing it is saying, I'm using trial functions. Do it that way. And that's all fine, and, and I mean, uh, when you make a trial function, you make a guess. And if you're clever, you make a good guess. And BCS are very clever people, so they made a good guess. But a guess is still a guess. With other words, what Yang and I would like very much to see is a really a very excellent young theorist who knows all sorts of things about diagrams and field theory, even Green's function if necessary, and uses that, uses that to derive to derive, please, the BCS theory strictly and rigorously from the microscopic equations. All right, I mean, uh, he will show that certain times terms don't matter. He should show. This, I'm sorry to say, has not been done, and I would like it very much to be done. Now, <clears throat> as to more tangible things to be done, there are certain things which uh, deserve more attention, they have been somewhat discussed. Uh, my proof, as you may have observed, if you watched my fingers very closely, you may have observed that I really assume altogether reversible processes because I base myself on the free energy, on equilibrium, exact equilibrium at a certain temperature. I consider variations of this equilibrium, but I still keep the local, the uh, instantaneous uh, equilibrium value of the kernel, the free energy, which means in thermodynamical parlance that I assume the process to be reversible. Now one has to be careful about that because there is of course a certain relaxation time, that is to say if you de deviate from equilibrium, it will be reestablished within a certain time, which can be very short but still finite. And what therefore one has to, as soon as you have a finite variation, 
you can make it as slow as you please, and the slower you make it, the better you are off, the better I am off. But uh, for any finite variation, you have to ask yourself about essentially the, uh, <coughs> uh, the ratio of the relaxation time to the period of the curve, the characteristic parameter is new tau, tau is relaxation time. That is to say, does the relaxation occur in a very small fraction of, that would be good if the relaxation time occurs in a small fraction of the cycle. Now, in the normal Joseph experiment, uh, you use frequencies, uh, well, the frequencies are in the range of uh, mm, 10 megas, no more than that, uh, well, what is it, 1,000, yeah, about, maybe 10 to the 10 cycle, something like that. Now, <coughs> I think it's, it's very likely, and I would be surprised that the relaxation time were as long as that, I'm sure it's, it's much shorter, so, and anyhow, one can also the smaller frequencies. However, this question of the effect of the relaxation is not yet <coughs> completely studied. I made an ad hoc phenomenological assumption introducing it by sort of a certain time delay. Uh, Professor Scalapino, who is speaking here on August 28th, has also considered the effect of, of relaxation time comes to a somewhat different conclusion, and uh, I don't know, we have had a little correspondence, and I wish I could meet him here. Uh, maybe that, that is not too difficult a question to be settled. He introduced the relaxation time in the landau ginzburg equation itself, whereas I introduced the phenomenologic. I have a feeling once it is thought through, there ought not to be a contradiction. If there is, then I think it might be something rather profound. Uh, well, Well, <laughs> well, I mean... <laughs> Can I repeat funny. that question so that we get on the tape? Oh, yes. Uh, uh, Professor Matthias at uh, the University of Berkeley in, in uh, La Jolla goes around and says <laughs> the BCS, uh, BCS is worthless because you can, they can, he, he asks them, here's an alloy. Here, tell me what the transition temperatures, and they can only say, oh, well, it might be 15 degrees or 18 degrees or 12 degrees, but Mr. Matthias is an experimentalist and makes a great deal of difference to whether it's 18 degrees or 12, and if it were 22, he would be a very great man. He's already at 21 or so. So he's demanding, I would say, he's demanding a little bit much from theorists. In a way, it's a great compliment to theorists that he thinks that theorists could, in principle, calculate transition temperatures to distinguish whether it's 21 degrees or 22. And since they don't do that, he feels they're worthless. Well, <laughs> he goes well than that. He says the BCS theory is worthless. Well, I am, of course, by no means of that opinion. I would say uh, for a model, it's the best model we have, and it has uh, shown to have a very wide range of validity. And as a matter of fact, when I spoke before about the promising theories, I doubt that when he has done it, he will come out to, with results which will markedly differ from the conclusion of BCS. It will largely confirm the BCS theory, so he will say, maybe it wasn't worth the trouble if I only confirm it. But uh, it isn't proven. And, and so, I am also considered as a skepticist to the BCS theory because I don't consider it quite as firmly established as special relativity. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I think, uh, I think uh, <laughs> much as I like Matthias and admire him for the work he has done, he has, of course, found more superconductors than anybody else and has pushed the temperature higher than anybody else. And so, uh, but I would say, he just thinks too highly of theorists. <laughs> they will never be able to calculate from first principle a, a transition temperature too well. If they do it within 10%, they're doing very well. Now, it is a little bit the fault of, the, of people like, uh, like uh, Schrieffer and Anderson and so on, that they act as if it were special relativity. And they say, sure, we can predict to you. Well, they have some formula where they divide temperature enters and so on. What would you say? They may be good to 10% or something like that. That's remarkable that they can go that far. But by acting so cocksure, uh, people begin to think like Matthias. Well, all right. I mean, if you know everything, then give us the exact answer. But, uh, well, I mean, there's, of course, more work to be done there. I don't believe ever that you will give me or anybody will give an alloy and you 
perspective and the elements of the crystalline structure, and then he just sits down or feeds a computer, and out comes a, uh, <laughs> a critical temperature. Uh, that is just expecting too much. Well, we have time. Perhaps one or two more questions before we conclude. Any questions? Well, Professor Matthew. Well, um, two questions uh, yet. Uh, one, what would you think? What do you think about other interactions other than the electron-phonon interaction? Oh, that's, oh, that's, that's a very interesting question. Yes, indeed. Uh, <clears throat> of course, uh, in the it isn't necessarily built into the BCS theory that the pairing process is based upon. Uh, interaction between phonons and electrons. You see, to, for pairing, well, may I say I'm just very naive, for pairing, in order to get pairing, you need, of course, a attractive force between electrons, which can overcompensate the Coulomb repulsion. And Freudy has pointed out a long time ago that through interaction with the phonons, this is possible. And in fact, that is the basis. When people calculate the transition temperatures, that's what they do. They consider the interaction with phonons. Now, as I say, if you look at the, at the BCS theory in its more general formulation, just postulating pairing or asking for the condition, all you need is some, well, it has to be an attractive force of the right kind. It mustn't be long range. It must be a rather short range interaction. But such thing certainly can arise from other different reasons. And the interesting suggestion has been made that Instead of asking for interaction of the conduction electrons with the ions, to ask for similar things to happen of the conduction, uh, interaction between the conduction electrons and other electrons somewhere in the system. And I see no, no, nothing fundamentally wrong in the idea that this kind of interaction energy could be much, much stronger than the ion energy, and therefore the idea of eventually constructing somehow substances which will have a transition temperature at, uh, oh, at uh, 100 degrees or room temperature, or perhaps even higher, uh, does certainly not seem absurd to me. Uh, there is a good deal of uh, experimenting going on, and it's mostly chemistry, what people are doing, because the idea is it might even come from some organic molecules, but I believe also uh, that some more thorough theoretical investigations would be very valuable. I think at the present moment, as far as I know, Bill Little in our department, who is actually an experimentalist but knows a good deal of theory, is the only one who, who well, uses orbitals and takes all the knowledge from the theoretical chemists. He's the only one who wor worries about these things seriously. And I would say that uh, this might be well worth a close look from a theoretical point of view. Now, Matthias just sneers at it. He just says, this is all hot air. Maybe it will turn out to be hot air sometime, but it certainly does not seem to me impossible. So that's the important, I think, the most important other coupling than ions that I can think of. And, uh, well. Anybody who can do some good calculations there may do a very great deal of service to physics. Well, on that inspiring note, perhaps we can close. We have one last question. <laughs> All right. <laughs> one last one. Where would you put the the uh, strong coupling theories in between the you know between ignorance and true knowledge? <laughs> That's a deep question. <laughs> would you mind defining it to me? What do you mean? In, in, in the sense that the strong coupling theories purport to start from the electron phonon interaction and really, really don't use a phenomenological interaction in the way that BCS do. Well, I must confess, I, I'm not sure that I know the answer to that. I would offhand say it's the best they can do. And uh, maybe it's good enough for the purposes. I'm sorry, I, I could not tell you. <laughs> With where to choose between these two limits. Well, thank you again, Professor Bloch. It's indeed a pleasure having you. I think the session is closed. <laughs>